Calling all beings. We are so excited to be here because of the talent in the room. I'm your host, DJ, along with the co conspirator in fun, interesting, entertaining, and sometimes even deep UAP talk money, Nathan. Uh oh, he's on mute. What is up, everybody? Let's try that one more time. Happy Saturday. Uh, man, international, international show. I love that. England, Ireland, Scotland, Wales. What's up? We're yeah! All We're all happily getting along. That's it yes. Can be done. It can be done. Uh, another original gangster from Cab, of course, is a study of UAP. Debs, what's going on, homegirl? I'm just honored to host the people from across the pond. <laughs> this is this is unbelievable, and we'll talk about this. It's like going on three years into these friendships now, which is just it. Man, it, it really does. It really makes me so happy. Uh, our our cabbie uh, prospect right here with the one percent patch on on her her vest uh, is Courtney Marcasani. What's up, Courtney? Hey, all. Also honored to be here on Cab. Sitting in. I got a list of questions. I can't wait to get to it. Uh, we're honored to have you. Uh, and look who just dropped in. Wales just got in this joint. <laughs> So we're so excited, but if I may real quick, uh, an open letter to an ET just to kick things off. Okay. Make sure I get the right. Oh, here it is. Open letter to an ET. Certainly we humanity acknowledge that you have some great tech, but you know what? A lot of it's been done before. And we humans also have figured out a few things. Silent propulsion. It's already been done. Okay. The Caterpillar Drive, didn't you guys see Hunt for Red October in the 90s? Okay, the Russians already figured this out. You know, you have these, these five ob uh, observables, uh, like low observability is one. But everybody knows that Star Trek did it with the Romulans in 1966. There's nothing new here, okay? I mean, let's see if you can do some of the things we can do. You know, every Thanksgiving, Courtney makes an amazing Dutch apple pie. You know, she gets all the butter kind of in there with the cinnamon and the brown sugar. Can you do that? Huh? Can you do that? Deb, when she makes her hamburger helper, I mean, she always goes to the pantry and she, you know, she takes a big dollop of that tomato paste, you know, to thicken it up for the kids. I mean, uh, do you even have a pantry on that black triangle? You know, Nathan, this winter, spent all this time you know, he's out there, he puts on a sort of Paul Bunyan-esque flannel, and he's out there cutting wood, splitting cords of wood. You guys don't even have that opposable thumb. How are you going to do that, huh? Yeah, that's exactly what I thought. You know, those skinny legs like McGrillin, man, you came out on the football pitch with him. He's going to slide tackle you into next week. So before you <laughs> underestimate us humans, we have some talent too. So have some damn respect and one love. <laughs> I love you guys. All right. All right. <laughs> Without further ado, uh, we are, uh, as Courtney said, we're honored uh, that we could get this group together because they're all very busy people who produce their own shows, produce music, all kinds of stuff. And um, they decided to uh, take, oh, it, uh, Daniel's outside the room. Let me get you back in here. Okay. there. Hi, Daniel. You're back. Yeah. Okay. So uh, let me start at the top. Um, he is the host of the amazing That UAP podcast. Uh, it's become sort of a something of a standard bearer in the community. And uh, he hasn't been on cab for a while, so it's an honor to have you. The beard is looking great. Andy, chilling with McGrillin, representing Scotland. Hi, everyone. Happy to be here representing Scotland. Uh, Scotland. Uh, this is my real accent, so it's uh, good to be here, DJ. Thank you. <laughs> uh, can't believe you got the name of the podcast wrong as well. It's all the UFO podcast. Yeah, you're yeah. lucky. Oh, that's a, you're lucky that hasn't live, DJ, and it's recorded. Okay. You can do that again. <laughs> okay, okay, buddy. That <laughs> UFO 
podcast. <laughs> I don't know how. I think it's because it's UA, UFO UAPAM is your mm-hmm. handle. So that UFO podcast, uh, the name has now been used by a couple of different UFO shows. <laughs> uh, excuse me, Bigfoot shows that are that are uh, copying off that moniker. Andy. Sorry about that, brother. Okay, it's okay. I've copyrighted, and there are trademark uh, uh, files going into those people now to cease and desist all their shows. Um, so yeah, <laughs> can I get an amen? Just like nobody here will say engaging the, and I won't say that third word, or I'll hear from James's lawyer. All right, <laughs> uh, just below him is uh, representing Wales. Uh, this gentleman is a researcher, aggregator of news, and if something happens, if someone that's big in the UAP community flatulates. Dan knows about it about five seconds later. That is the signal. Dan Zetterstrom. <laughs> and he also uh, is part of that UFO podcast. What, what? So I'm part of that UAP podcast, but what an introduction. I'm here to, to have a whale of a time representing whales. <laughs> and I'm glad to be in the room. There are a host of wonderful faces that I've either spoken to online. Uh, Courtney, we exchanged emails once, and I've been eager to talk to you since. Uh, life just hasn't hasn't enabled it to happen, but it's lovely to connect with everyone and see your beautiful, smiling faces in the positive space. So thank you for having me. Thank you, Dan. It's been a while since we've seen you too, so it's awesome to see you on. Here's here's Mark. Mark is in the uh, is in the chat there. Um, this gentleman right here is uh, hosting a, a Bigfoot uh, cryptid conference here over in the UK coming up. Is it June, Daniel? Uh, yeah, it is. It's um, it's June. July, April and July. Yeah, April and <laughs> April and July. So he is now an author. He is a Bigfoot researcher who has collected uh, uh, some DNA in the in the UK uh, from from a, a Bigfoot. Um, podcaster mythical legends podcast right yeah can i yeah can i get an amen for daniel barnett amen yes hey guys and um thank you so much dj for having me on um and it's what and it's wonderful t- to meet all of you yep i as soon as i got to meet you i was like oh it'll be so cool to bring somebody bigfoot in the room so uh, right next to Courtney right there is uh, a gentleman who I mentioned on Twitter. I, I had the honor of speaking to uh, a couple of weeks ago. And man, we we laughed. Uh, we made fun of a certain debunkers and just had a great time. And I learned a lot about what his mission is uh, that involves uh, autism advocacy there in Ireland. And just, uh, you know, because just because of all of you, um, people want to make this go away. And because of Every single one of you that is on this panel right now, you will not let it go away, and it won't. It won't go away, and that's what just what I admire so much about all of you. So, uh, so none other than Ireland's own Rob Sheridan. Hi, hi guys. Thanks for having me. And Andy, you look more like uh, Conor McGregor than I do, and I'm sure you could pull off the accent much better than I could. Can you uh, do a McGregor? Oh, I'll do a McGregor. No. Who the, who the fuck is that guy? God, can I swear? <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah. That was damn good. Andy. That was bad. Sorry, Rob. <laughs> yeah, that that was, people there. It's all right. I could do. I could do my worst Dublin accent, but you're gonna need subtitles for that, to be honest. Uh, yeah. No, thanks very much for having me. I feel completely imposter syndrome here. I don't feel qualified enough to sit with you guys. But oh my I, god, you happy, happy to listen. My God, you are so qualified. Uh, that's what's great is everybody has a place in the conversation. You know, we all have different areas where we're strong and different areas where we're not as strong. And But together, you know, we, we make like one big brain and uh, this helping to move it forward. And, uh, of course, uh, the gentleman there who is uh, getting ready to have uh, his own virtual conference, uh, A-R-E-F. Remind me what it stands for again. It is the anomalous... Wait, I'm not going to get it right now. Why did no, I do that? I have that? it on Word doc right here. I can bring it's it up. It's the Anomalous just... Research and Exploration Forum. Thank you. Right, because I got to do, I got to, we're going to shoot that little promo for that. And I have a, a script already written out. So everybody knows him. He's a host of another prolific podcast in this space, has spoken internationally, uh, and has an amazing show that is another kind of standard bear. So Vinny Adams, everybody. Yeah! Cheers, guys. Woo-hoo! My friend. Good to be here. 
And uh, this young lady right here, uh, we've known uh, basically almost since the beginning of Cab, I would say, because um, we had a we had a cool intro, and then she made our intro even more cool, uh, where she got in touch with uh, one of our cabbies and said, "Hey, you know, I can I can make you guys a a song and and make you guys a video." And boy, huh, what a talented young lady! And she is Charlotte the Thunderbird. Hey. Hey. <laughs> hey, how's it going? Cheers. It is an <laughs> cheers. cheers. Uh, it's it's great to have you back on. It's been a great while back. since we've seen you, Andy, and Dan. So th this is great. Oh, uh, anyway, I can't believe I'm ever put into that kind of little grouping. It's amazing. Oh well, why? You know what? Uh, we're one big family, right? Like I said, everybody has their their areas. There's no one person in this area that has a, a grasp on every single thing, but together, you know, we sort of uh, have a little bits and pieces that, that, that add to the story. And we have people who see things that I don't see, you know, but then I hear one of you speak about the topic and, and it just illuminates something for me and teaches me something, you know, I'm, I'll never forget uh, just real quick, a, a phone conversation I had with, with Andy very early on in our friendship and we were talking about the UAP versus UFO moniker. And, you know, I'm coming from an aviation background, but it was Andy who said to me, well, maybe they're not flying. Maybe what they're doing is not flying. And I was like, oh, yeah, OK. Uh, so that really opened my mind as to how this term UAP may be more applicable than UFO, even if UFO is more endearing. So with that, Nathan, uh, take it away, brother. And we got to get started with those, the folks who have early outs. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I won't take up much time, but just happy to have all of you with us, uh, echoing everything that DJ said. Thanks for all of your contributions in the community and to the topic. Uh, let's get started, right? We're going to do a little round table action. Now, the screen obviously isn't round. We're going to do our best with a square table here. But uh, we're going to start off, I think, with Daniel, right, DJ? Yes, sir, please. And uh, the way this generally works is, um, Daniel, you'll get a chance to introduce a topic and, you know, everybody try to keep your topic short and your reply short as well. So we've got a lot of folks we got to get through and we're just going to go around the room and give everybody a chance to uh, chime in, respond on the topic. If you don't have anything to add, that's fine. Just say, you know, get me on the next pass and we'll come back to you uh, on the next topic. So we're going to start off with Daniel. And then I think from there, maybe just for the interest of going clockwise from what i can see uh we'll go to uh charlotte um that's not clockwise at all courtney all right and then we'll just go around from there so hopefully i can keep track of these nine faces all right so daniel kick us off here so my topic is um bigfoot and ufos what do you think um what do you guys think about that Love that. Open-ended. Courtney, go for it. Hey, Daniel. I love the work that you do. Um, you know, I didn't used to be a Bigfoot person, but you kind of become a Bigfoot person being in the UFO community. So I watched a series by National Geographic probably about a year ago. I think it was Ronnie Burnett, maybe. Don't quote me on that. But one of the most interesting things I thought about it was his scientific algorithm, where they had developed an algorithm around the United States, you know, in these different areas of research where... Bigfoot supposedly would come up. It was either a migration or breeding, or they weren't exactly sure why, but they had developed this algorithm to kind of track them. Have you ever heard of that? And do you have that where you are? Well, so what he was doing, so let me explain how this, what he's doing is he's asking a question and then you, you answer the question or give your thoughts on his question. So, but, but where is your asking a question? Well, so, I was trying to prepare. So, yes, okay. you, you come across Bigfoot as a subculture in UFO research. And, yes, you have to take it seriously. That's my answer. Yeah. Plus, I had a question. Maybe we'll get back to that. We, we will. We will. Yeah. If, if Dan has time, we'll definitely get to that. I think you're talking about the Scott Tompkins Bigfoot mapping project. But um, anyway, but yeah, it's your first time you're getting the hang of this. Go ahead. Hey, guys. Sorry about that. My dog is digging tiles here in the kitchen. I don't know what's wrong. <laughs> That's expensive. Oh, speaking of Bigfoot, she used to be really hairy like Bigfoot and now she's shaved. So I brought her to a, a barber and she shaved her skin tight. But anyway. Bigfoot shaving uh, project. Yeah, Bigfoot. 
Uh, I know from a scientific perspective, I think it's very interesting. And yeah, the Bigfoot story, I don't know much about it, but I think you mentioned there, Dan, that you have some DNA. Am I right? Um, I think that would be interesting. It'd be interesting to see what a PCR test does. Be interesting to see what the RNA is from that. Um, if there's any base pairs that are similar to human beings, who knows? Is there a correlation between that and, and the phenomenon itself? Interesting. I think it's important that we ask these questions. I think it's really important that we don't leave everything off the table the way debunkers do. Um, you don't know what you don't know. And, you know, as Gary Nolan said, the fundamental core of science is asking the question. And there's, there's always two outs to science as a result. It's, it's basically, well, is it going to go my way in terms of hypothesis, which is interesting. But if it doesn't go my way, it even makes it more interesting to say, OK, well, that didn't work out the way I planned. That's science. We keep moving forward. So nothing's off the table as far as I'm concerned. DJ, what about you? You're next, buddy. Oh, so yeah, I okay. I didn't know I was actually in this, but yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, Daniel, just restate the question so I make sure I, I have it because I didn't know I was going to be answering. Well, go ahead. Uh, um, so it would be um the relation between UFOs and okay. Bigfoot. So um, in terms of Bigfoot as a reality, uh, as I've said on on um, several different shows that I've been on, we have a criminal court standard of evidence that proves that Bigfoot exists as a physical biological entity. Um, it's beyond a reasonable doubt when you take uh, the, the Patty film, you take all the foot track casts that have been done, you take uh, the, the, the uh, Melba Ketchum DNA study, uh, and then you take the thousands of witnesses in a criminal trial, that would be enough to earn a conviction. What we don't have uh, that is possible, but we don't have the evidence for, is any relation direct relation to ufos or the paranormal that doesn't mean that it's out of the realm of possibility it's within the realm of possibility and we do see orbs in a lot of situations where we see bigfoot but we just don't have we haven't met that standard of evidence that we could take forward and say this is proof uh whereas the existence of the creature we do have proof so that that's where i'm at on that on that deb yeah, I think the thing that keeps coming up is that people are seeing orbs and UAP around the sighting of a Bigfoot. So I just want to throw out there that there's a possibility that if we're being visited, um, that the entities are interested in the primates on the planet. And may it may be that Bigfoot are experiencers. So that, I agree that may 100%. Yeah, so that may be the connection there because it seems to be, you know, and, and the way they communicate with infrasound and things like that might be of interest. So they might be more interesting than humans. So <laughs> that's my thought on it. <laughs> Love it. The babysitter. Benny. Yeah, it's an interesting one. I always kind of lean towards Bigfoot being a reality related more to a Gigantopithecus, something that you know, crossed over to the US uh, over these land bridges a long time ago. But you do hear about orbs and UFOs associated with Bigfoot. And I suppose, I guess, like everyone else has said, you can't like completely ignore it. You can't take it off the table until it's been proven one way or another. It's fascinating. Um, you know, there are cases where people say, you know, Bigfoot's just appeared. There was no noise of them moving towards them or anything. So could there be something otherworldly to it? Absolutely. I I'm open to that. I just want to add in, Vinny, before we pass it, uh, we have interviewed some very, very credible people with, with uh, accounts like that. People that uh, we know have had those physical sightings and also have had some sightings that they couldn't explain. And so, right. yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, Is that uh, and Dan? Are we going to, oh, Charlotte. Hi, hey. Charlotte. Um, yeah, I think so partly the same as Vinny. So is it like something we haven't discovered yet? There was that family in Siberia that they discovered um, where they turned out to be like sub-Saharan Africans and they've just been isolated in Siberia for ages. And I think their descendants are still around today. That's quite an interesting story, though not all of it is suitable for young listeners. So I'm not going to go into it here. Um, but um, There's that side. And then there's kind of like the whole UFO topic what about ghosts? Is that part of it? You know, I've seen a ghost. What the hell was it? There was a dude in my kitchen when the house was empty. 
you know could it be part of the same thing you know who knows what entities and visual kind of representations we could see from the whole phenomena thing so i'm either side i don't know enough about it but i will be informed by you guys love that thanks charlotte dan hi so i'm having a little bit of connection trouble so let me know if you need me to repeat anything okay um <laughs> ufos and bigfoot are really interesting because already we've had a, a whole swath of answers from from the woo to the nuts and bolts and you know we, we can look at this a bunch of different ways either bigfoot is kind of a missing link from our previous evolution and it's a rare form of life a few holdovers from that missing link that's just out there hiding in this wilderness that people really don't have have a grasp on existing you know there are huge swaths of land where wildlife could be and we're finding new wildlife in there all the time so we we have to kind of accept that there could be new species there if there is a holdover then anyone visiting to study us would be really interested in the last few specimens of a species like that. So it makes sense to me that UFOs would be looking at them if we're looking at it in a nuts and bolts way. The other way to look at it is the, the kind of the woo way. Um, when we can think of that in a sense of, you, you know, either kind of these multidimensional cryptids kind of coming over and, and everything associated with that, or we can think of it as, you know, for example, Tom DeLong talks about parallel timelines and that all of time has happened already and what we're seeing is the overlap of things coming here from the future and things coming here from the past. So what could, we could be seeing is a species that developed maybe in the four point, I think Earth is 4.52 billion years old. That's a, that's a pretty long time. Um, all sorts of life could have developed then. So we could have a different species instead of us that's kind of ruling the earth that is technologically based and could be skipping about time. And there you have the woo stuff. So it's completely viable, completely realistic that these things could happen. But what is it? We don't know. We, we need to kind of get out and do the science. Like DJ said, the, the standard of evidence has far surpassed a courtroom already. So we just need to go and, and do the science instead of, you know, looking at something like the Patterson Gimli film and just dismissing it because of all of these armchair skeptics online. When you actually delve into the Lord, there's so much evidence there and it's a really interesting subject. You guys just not, I'm waiting for Andy, but you guys just knocked this one out of the park, man. Yeah, I mean, cool. <laughs> and Dr. Meldrum alone, I think has like 300 foot casts and then uh, Cliff Barrickman has hundreds. So yeah, there's, there's, there's plenty out there. Uh, Miss, Mr. Andy McGrillen. I thought Dan's answer was terrible. Um, <laughs> <laughs> about as good as his, his other <laughs> connection is. Even are you? Um, <laughs> oh, am I on? Sorry, I thought I was speaking to myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I don't think there's a direct connection as in these things are walking off of UFOs or they're necessarily being studied by UFOs. But I think if you if you have like this whole phenomenon as a spider diagram, maybe similar to what Charlotte was saying, that if in the middle it's a big blank bubble, and off of that just now you've got UFOs, ghosts, Bigfoot, and everything else, I think we're probably missing a connection somewhere as to, as to what that would be. Um, I do think, and I suppose to looking at the Monsters in California movie, Tom DeLong brought out. Um, I've got the hoodie and that's got Bigfoot on it, you know, so get lots of funny looks on him out and about wearing that. But the there's a whole, not to spoil it, a whole scene with Bigfoot in that. And I think the illusion is that there's stuff underneath the planet, you know, elsewhere. And I think there's a good chance that's, I was talking to someone the other day about this, you know, could there be, and why couldn't there be whole other species inhabiting a little bit deeper under the planet when you look at us inhabiting the earth and if you kind of sliced it in half and just looked and went we inhabit this tiny little bit of the crust on the top and not even all of it just this little portion you know that pangea when you put it all together everything else is according to us is empty or just dirt inside and we don't know that so who's to say there's not whole other species evolved and everything else underneath um which I think would be the most viable and likely likely scenario. And now and again, these things come up and out rather than something coming from out to, to us, like from a UFO point of view. So, yeah. That was actually mentioned on Daniel's round table that he had that hypothesis. And I, I think you and Deb have both drawn an interesting distinction. There's the, the, and Dan also touched on this. There's the woo aspect that says they are from UFOs, which 
I mean, that that's way out there. And then the other ones, they could be the victim of abductions, just like humans would. Like they would want to study a moose. They also might want to study this hairy thing, but that doesn't mean their origin is with them. So there's multiple tangents here, but interesting. Uh, Money, Nathan. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of you have alluded to the fact that this represents um, the the sort of fringe experience that the human civilizations and societies have had over over years, right? That the, the UFOs and Bigfoot and the paranormal. These are experiences that people purportedly have, but they occur sort of at the fringes of what we would call normal reality, at least in our modern day, what we would call normal reality. And I think they're worth studying, uh, worth taking seriously. We know people, as DJ mentioned, people who've had experiences with both, um, very credible people who've had experiences with both UFOs and Bigfoot. Um, I think we've yet to necessarily see, uh, as many of you have said, you know, Bigfoot coming out of a UFO or uh, there may have been a couple of accounts like that, but they're really, you know, highly speculative, obviously. Uh, but I think just generally they represent this aspect of our knowledge that we have kind of ignored and, and put to the side. And we're now at a place where we're beginning to question that, take it a little bit more seriously, willingness to open our aperture a little bit wider and say maybe things that we've rejected as part of our, you know, kind of carving up of reality of what is okay and normal, what is not. Maybe those rejected things are worth our, our consideration and worth our study, even if they're difficult to study and, and to observe. They're worth taking seriously, and difficult to internalize that it, it that it is part of reality. You know, um, I just want to say, our, speaking of multiple experiencers, so next month we're going to debut on Untold Radio Network uh, with under uh, Doug Highcheck's banner. Doug was the creator of Monster Quest. And I've been fortunate to have a lot of phone conversations. He has experienced both UFOs, uh, paranormal, and Bigfoot. Uh, in fact, he goes to a remote cabin <laughs> uh, once a year where they have to go in on a seaplane so you can't hike there. <laughs> and and Bigfoot comes and slaps on the cabin and all and all that stuff. He's Doug is 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 pretty fearless in my mind. So um, anyway, uh, so I got the order. The order we're in, based on what Nathan just pitched out there, was Daniel, Courtney, Rob, DJ, Deb, Vinny, Charlotte, Dan, Andy, and Money Nathan. So it is now, uh, uh, Courtney, if you have a topic, and uh, it'll go from you to, um, to Rob. So my topic is UFOs. I'm, you know, just heavily heavily involved with the UFO research. And so I did want to pose a, a question to this group about uh, a sighting that I thought was really interesting. It was off the coast of Ireland, and I'm sure you guys heard about it. Um, if you hadn't, it was lights that appeared and there was a plane, there was a female pilot who had seen them and she called it in. And then another plane nearby had also seen it and documented it. And I'm not sure if one of the planes had to land back in Ireland, but I wanted to know what your viewpoint was on this case, if you're familiar with it. And if UFO research researchers there, how would they would consider that like compared to US UFO sightings? Now it goes to Rob, what couldn't be more apropos than that. Do you know what? I didn't even know about that case. I did read about a case that happened in the Midlands of Ireland and on the east coast of Ireland where the the Gardaí, as we call them over there, or over here, uh, the police uh, spotted something that was anomalous. And But that particular case, I don't know. Was it the west coast? West coast? Galway? Kerry? What part? Yeah, it was the West Coast. If it, it was off the West Coast, and I believe I pulled it up for today. I believe it was okay. in 2019. I'll get it for you. Okay, cool, cool. Um, Ireland is very small. We depend on the rest of the world for information, but we do have a handful of good scientists. There was one scientist in the Irish Independent recently speaking about the UAP situation and his theory about it. Um, and he's really pushing it over here. I think he's way ahead of the curb in terms of the information that we have. Um, and that he's sharing, um, you know, domestically. Uh, there isn't really a strong community over here, as, as far as I know. Our reporting system is pretty bad. It goes through the FAA, which gets lost in translation. I think we're about 20 years behind. Um, but what I do know is that the, in terms of statistics, I don't actually have the numbers, but Ireland is the highest, the West Coast of Ireland has the highest reports of UAP activity in Europe. 
Wow. And and next to that, uh, yeah, and it's and it's a funny one because we don't actually have a a huge reporting um, process, but we we do we do capture the information. I don't think there's much stigma here about it. I mean, you're talking about a country that talks about folklore and little green men, you know, uh, leprechauns and stuff like that, you know. But you know, we we do take our history very seriously, and we're a very open-minded country. Uh, we're a very liberal country. Um, and we're very open to new ideas and new ways of thinking. Um, and the science is very, very strong in this country in relation to STEM. And that's something that I'm looking to push with a few others in relation to the UAP discussion at academic level. Um, but that particular case, I apps, I have no, I, I'd love to read more about it, to be honest. I can share, I can share with you. BBC covered it and they put it as uh, off of the west coast of Ireland, UFO spotted off Irish coast under investigation. Um, you can find it dated 2018 in November. And so they were traveling on a British Airlines and um, British Airlines pilot contact Shannon Air Force control or air control traffic control yeah that's that's airport, where the yeah. case was you know located and it was big i remember it was big at the time but i hadn't heard much about it since that's why i brought it up today to see how your your groups over there might include that in investigations or the history about it okay interesting one i'll have a look at that right, dj yeah um it, the crux of the question was what was i, I there was a uh, what was the crux of the question aspect of it, if you don't mind, Courtney? If you. it's included in the history there in the UK and in Ireland and how it's looked at in comparison is maybe our U.S. Mm. history of sightings and where that fits in and how people classify it. So, yeah, Research. I mean, it seems like that that question would definitely be directed uh, at, at Rob and the others. But just from an outside, because I'm not inside uh, uh, of the British Isles it seems like they take this in the same way that 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 we do at least if we're using the the folks on the screen here as our litmus test i mean they may say that you know what the larger populace is not tracking and not accepting um so i would only be using them as a as a barometer and they're the ones that would tell me if that's an accurate barometer or inaccurate but it's a great question well, if we're not familiar with that case, then we can do another question, depending on how everyone feels about that question, if you're familiar with that case or not. I'm, I'm good with another question. We've got to make sure we get Andy in here because Andy has a hard out in 25 minutes. Yeah, try, um, Courtney, if you want to change yeah, the, the topic just a little bit. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Okay, let's go to Rendlesham. So Rendlesham, there is a lot of talk, especially here in the U.S. among researchers about the symbols that were on the outside of the craft. There's been a book written about it. And I wonder what people's take is on the symbols, how you view that, whether it's from another symbol civilization or maybe just leave it open to what you think those symbols might be in your own research, how you categorize that. Yep. Oh. oh, I'm going. Okay. I was comparing those symbols to other ships that have been seen. And if you guys look into this, it's pretty interesting. There's two styles. So there's a geometric style, which tends to be very much like shapes. And then there is um, like runic. That's, so there's two different distinct patterns coming out when people report having seen um, hieroglyphs or um, symbols on UAPs. I think we need to have someone do a deeper dive on that, but it's a really intriguing aspect. And I have asked about it before, and someone has told me that behind the scenes, there is work being done on the language aspect of UAPs. Hmm, interesting. Vinny, what you got on this one? Oh, man. The more from over the years, the, the more and more muddy this whole case gets for me because if you look at the primary and secondary sources there is so much conflicting testimony that is just i i don't know where to go with it i don't know who to believe even you know where the, where the symbols real uh, i have to question that these days you know because i just don't know what has been added into the story to keep it going in the community um i really struggle with it to be honest Vinny, if I could follow, just follow up, what does your gut tell you? Man, 
my gut tells me that something anomalous happened over, well, what we would consider three nights back then. Some people might argue that it was a lot more. Again, we don't know for sure. We're still, you know, there are still people talking. I think there are people out there that know that haven't come forward. But when you look at Charles Holt and some of the other big names that are involved, you know, there are smaller names that were involved who we haven't heard enough from. Adrian Bastinza and and a few others who were on base that night. Even the, the the top base commander who was above Holt, you know, he's piped up over the years. I just think I I'd be surprised if we ever get to the bottom of Rendlesham, to be honest. And I don't like to be pessimistic, to... unfortunately. I was just happy to hear what your gut tells you because sometimes that's all we have to go on. You know, in 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 the absence of absolute proof, you go with the best expert. And, and just for me. And if you don't have that, then you have to go with uh, what you know and what you believe to be true and why you believe that to be true. You guys have heard me say that about the video Andy posted of the alien. I believe that's true based on a lot of things. That's what my gut tells me. That's genuine. Other people not willing to walk out on that limb with me. And that's totally cool. But um, yeah, next. Charlotte. Hey, sorry, just trying to mute myself. For once, I have something relevant to add to this. Um, so, yeah, just really echoing what Vinny said, I suppose. But my um, one of my best friends happened to have been at Rendlesham when it happened. So um, his grandfather was the Reverend Bailey, who was like the village. I can't remember the blooming village name next to Rendlesham, but he was the Reverend of that community village. Um, so my friend over the years though he was a baby when it happened or a, you know a kid young kid three i guess um he's found out little pieces as he's grown up so um there's things like his granddad experienced some missing time and some problems with his car nearby on the roads um there was a story that surfaced in a book um mentioning some sort of russian looking gentleman turning up at the base the next night or something he thinks that was his dad who had a russian hat and a larder there's all kinds of crazy things my friend has told me about to do with this so some of it is based on his granddad's perception and he was ex-military as well and then there's all these conspiracy theories in their family like was the granddad put there as the reverend for the church because he was ex-military and he would keep anything quiet his view my friend's view i think is that something went on probably to do with the nuclear stuff they secretly had there and possibly to do with um some high energy weapon as well he wasn't saying that something didn't land or anything or whatever but i think that's why my friend kind of like tried to work a bit with um professor simon on some of this but i think it didn't really get anywhere so um you know but yeah interesting stuff so I, i'm not sure anyone will ever get to the bottom of it really and i think there's maybe a lot of answers in the community about what happened that night that have never come to the fore and it would be nice if my friend could get some of his granddad's memoirs and information out i think but it's kind of difficult you know oh fascinating dan hi yeah this this case is i mean it's an old timer right it's it's the case that everybody knows but also the the fact that um senator john mccain's staff became involved in terms of getting an insurance payout uh, for one of the guys who were physically affected by anom anomalous health effects from this case is just it, it's explosive and that's worth talking about in itself the tale has obviously grown over time and, and we kind of got the coordinates after a while and some other bits being put in but i always feel like you kind of have to go back to the first reports and and kind of shake all that stuff off because there seems to be something about experiences and encounters with ufos that is so inspiring that time and time again people will have this inciting incident and then they start to hoax things to bring people in and share the wonder and the awe and you know whether we're looking at billy meyer or some other people it just keeps happening you know pe people want to recreate and and give others the experience that the waking up what the, the knowing what whatever it is it's really interesting Maybe part of it has to do with limiting up to expectations after sharing the original story as well. I don't know, but it's just, it's a common thing that happens. Everybody's touched on some really awesome things. So I'm just gonna throw in a left field kind of suggestion that maybe what if, so a lot of UFOs tend to have writing on them. They have symbols and they kind of, people say they look very much like ancient languages, uh, you know, Greek, Sumerian, this kind of stuff. The first thing that people do when they come across writing like that is there's an urge to touch it. It's almost like a primal urge. Hmm. So I wonder, 
I wonder when you look out in nature and you see things that mimic things to draw people in, for whatever reason, you know, the Venus flytrap will mimic a certain flower, so the fly lands on it and then voila, the, fly, the flowers got dinner. I wonder if it's something like this. I wonder if the, the writing is there to draw a person's curiosity to get them to touch it. And then we can either, you know, be imparted with knowledge or go spread a seed from a plant that maybe it's kind of given us. Uh, I think there are some really interesting possibilities here that haven't really been explored, kind of it being language and just saying, you know, corporation from the future would actually be a really boring outcome. Um, you, you know, we don't want to see just a flag on it. We we want to think outside the box here because if it turns out that the ship is biological in and of itself, then that could be messaging. It could be it mimicking us to attempt communication and what it gets right and what it doesn't get right it, it tells us a lot about the thing that it is you know whether it's a life form or whatnot um the one thing i will add though is it, it definitely seems to be that inciting incident and over the years we've heard we've never seen uh that there were materials collected from Reynolds Shum and i i'm really intrigued by that you know what is it that they had how did they get it uh, did something come off the craft when it landed? Um, was it there to do with the nuclear materials that were being, uh, you know, stored? We'll see. But all I can say for sure is that it's very likely, given Vinny's evasiveness, that Vinny was in the UFO from the future and he was coming back <laughs> on and I've just caught him out. <laughs> that, that's but. a brilliant answer, Dan, by the way. So I just got to give you, give you a little applause there. And Vinny, we knew you were deeper into this conspiracy than, than what we first thought. So obviously, uh, no, we got it. Are we going to Daniel now to get Daniel in before his uh, production? Almost meeting? there. Almost there. So Andy. Okay. Go ahead. Nice. I'll try and be really quick then. Uh, Cause I know Daniel's uh, press for time as well. Um, so I think if you look at the UFO conversation, I know I've spoke to Dan about this before that, Say disclosure happens tomorrow, UFO in the White House law and all that bullshit, right? Um, people then start asking, okay, where do they come from? And you find out, oh, they come from X, Y, and Z. And if we're talking nuts and bolt craft, then they have a location from somewhere, more than likely. Then are they being manufactured? So are they built in factories? Are they grown on what we would think of a tree? Are they just there? Are they manifested into existence? We don't know. So... Is it something everyone, I think, looks at, and it could be totally correct, I'm literally just jumping both sides of the fence here. Everyone thinks of any kind of marking as being, like Dan said, it could be something quite intelligent, like Dan said, or could it literally be the equivalent of made in China, but from wherever they are from, literally a branding? It could be that ridiculous, and that that might be quite dull or boring for some people, but it could be like something we've not even thought of, that it's a branding of some sort, and why not? Because... You can only really think of it from a from a human point of view. And like Dan said, why do we brand things? Why does nature mimic what, what it does um, to draw attention? And it could literally be, you know, the company that made it, the group that made it, whatever that might be. So, um, yeah, from a, from a, I like Dan's answer, though, before that it's, it wants you to potentially kind of reach out and touch it. But then if we heard of these things being up in the air and, you know, pilots aren't going to reach out and touch it, so are whales going to reach out and touch it? Now I've just got to reach out and touch it, but to the tune of reach out and touch me uh, in my head. So I apologize <laughs> for that. Uh, but yeah. I, I can answer and tell you that the Welsh would reach out and touch it. <laughs> I, and I agree. With, I, yeah. I totally agree with your answer, Andy. I was thinking that same thing is that the symbols would say to me, it kind of indicates a very nuts and boltsy and kind of manufacturer as opposed to some of the more organic um uh, sort of modalities that have been associated with other types of craft. And there may be an organic component to this as well uh, with waveguides and so forth, but there also, it, it does indicate that symbology that you're looking to to brand it and, and to communicate something like we would, uh, or at least from our perspective. It's an, an interesting take. Could be an insider way of saying, you know, made by the U.S. Air Force, DJ, you know. <laughs> Come on, please. Can we just not... <laughs> Well, that doesn't necessarily <laughs> reconcile, though, the additional part of the story, not like we have to answer this, but that there was binary, there was part of this that there was a binary transmission to Peniston. So that cut, makes it a little bit more complex, if you believe that part of it. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a great point. I mean, I, I just very quickly on this, too, I was going to bring up the McCain connection, which is really interesting. It's uh, a very official connection to this story from the U.S. government, which only adds to the intrigue. 
I've been thinking about this issue in terms of symbology writing for a while now that, that reportedly appears on many of these crafts and was thinking to myself, you know, if these were experimental craft of some kind and you were worried they might, you know, crash or land in foreign territory, maybe you just put some weird writing on there because, you know, you don't want it to be attributed to your particular nation. So you just kind of kind of create this additional weird lore mystique around the craft by just putting some nonsensical symbology on the side of it so that no one really knows where it originates from um, and it just kind of adds to this mystery that it gets just generated after contact with with the uh with the craft itself um so that's, that's my take and then daniel i want to get your take on this and i know you have uh have to head out so i want to give you a chance to say goodbye to everybody so my take on um on kind of right i'll, I'll go on randall's um so my team uh my my Bigfoot team run um, kind of does investigations um, in Randlesham quite a lot. And we, uh, I think we've got some kind of um, quite a lot of UFO and orbs activity. Now we're starting to put together a map and we're starting to put together kind of a um, kind of a chart on when they appear and kind of so hoping that that will kind of bring out something um, and say I'm I'm more the Bigfoot person of the team but um, kind of having these guys go and come back and go I don't know what the hell I saw um, it, it, it does remain the question of um, and I am going to say thank you so much to you all um, and um, nice meeting you all um, and say I'm sorry I gotta run to um, some other bits and pieces but thank you so much to you all and DJ Nathan thanks thank you Dan uh, thank you Daniel See you, Dan. take care yeah thanks. it's an honor to uh, have you here and to be your friend Daniel uh, I, I enjoyed talking with you and uh, we'll speak to you soon cheers thanks cheers all right. Well, I want to, uh, DJ, I know we've got some other time constraints. I want to give Andy a chance to yep. intro his topic. So I'm changing the order. I've got it written down. So I'll okay, just keep repeating like I have been. But Andy, I'm going to put you at the top of the list now. Don't blow it. No, thanks. <laughs> um, I want to read a passage from a book um, just in the time that I've got. No, I don't. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> just chapters, you know, <laughs> just the intro to War and um, Peace. Yeah. Um, so my question um so Dan and I literally recorded just literally, I'll say the word, recorded just before we came on here. Um, and we were talking about the the mummies that Jaime Musan and co are presenting. Um, and as part of that conversation, we got talking about um, how the UFO conversation is kind of in a phase. So like the Marvel movies had phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four, phase five, th four and five being terrible. And I feel like we're at this kind of like phase three, phase four of the UFO conversation. So if you look at the kind of 40s through to like the 80s, you had like the some of the projects, Grudge, Sign, Blue Book, um, like the early abductions, the early sightings, the early cases. You then had the kind of 90s, 2000s VHS documentary era. St uh, Stephen Greer stuff would come as part of that, the early advent of the internet. And then if you've got this as kind of phase three from New York Times to the Stars Academy, which has all kicked off the political background conversation, the military being involved and the, the opportunity to push the conversation once again out into the public and get that capital D disclosure. Um, and I just wonder from everyone then, if you say this, this phase is like phase three of the UFO conversation, say it goes nowhere and we don't get our end game or Infinity War movie that we hope, what do you think phase four could potentially look like? What could the next phase of the ufo conversation be great question rob andy stole my question damn damn it damn it, damn it. i uh, yeah First i mean the I look, rugby I, six nations and now this I'm yeah sorry. i know i know but like i mean <laughs> <laughs> really good question. I think there's, I think, first of all, I think there's a phase within each phase. And I think right now we're going through a very uh, kind of a staring contest phase with, with, with the debunkers and the naysayers and, and, and the, the scientists that are already pushing for this and the public that are already pushing for this, where we're moving into sort of a doubting phase now. You can actually clearly see it on uh, X or Twitter. And um, people are literally killing each other. In respect to that, I I don't know. I mean, I think I think there's two options that that we could 
after the election, we might get a few people that are that are in there that are looking at, you know, the UAPDA 2.0 and maybe push that through and, you know, uh, review what that looks like and, and you know, have, hopefully have a committee involved in terms of a public committee involved and, you know, pushing that down the line slowly but surely. Um, the other side of it is I, I think that we we could potentially have a extraordinary leak um, come down the line. Now, you could argue that in the world of AI, that's impossible. But I still think that there is a potential for a leak to come out. I do. I really do. And I think because the world is getting smaller and information is moving faster and people like David Grush, you know, have come out, I think that might permit that to happen. I think so. Um, and I think with, with the battle for information, because information is power, you know, around the world and how easily it could be leaked. And that China now, like China moves faster with innovation, China moves quicker in terms of developing new things, um, as opposed to the United States. There's less bureaucracy there, things move faster. I think that there is a war then for disclosure, I think, in the future, for disclosure and how that is presented. So somebody could hold somebody hostage for 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 a leak i don't know i don't know hmm. fascinating dj so if you use uh you know what what you've heard from lou and and those guys that there are things going on behind the scenes so let's say you know we believe that that's true and you take it in the context of a fight so right now you know the sort of uh what do you guys call them uh sk <laughs> uh and and that that whole crew that's trying to just squash this down it's not real i mean they're basically uh you know they're basically reversing what they told us on other times that there are things that we don't know about and now they're emphasizing there's nothing you know we haven't found anything anomalous don't have and they're trying to use words you know to parse it so i would say you know kind of like a fight is is kind of like you you wait till they relax their defenses a little bit they think they've got you and then you attack the area that they're that's not being guarded uh, whatever that flank happens to be, the leg, the ribs, the, the kidneys, etc. So I, I would guess that right now the folks that do have information like Lou and David Grush and and uh, those those sort of folks that they are sort of planning an attack, but they're going to wait until they lower their defenses and then come back with uh, with some some other piece of evidence that will then cause them to have to raise them again, rather than just I said this and then you said that, and then I said this and then you said that, and then you're kind of in a game of ping pong and tennis. So I I would assume that that's what they'll do is they'll let them relax and get comfortable, but uh, that. Um, if you listen to those guys and you believe those guys, uh, I don't think uh, they're going to go away. Just like I said at the beginning of the show, nobody here is going away. Yeah, great point. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so I think we were actually, we have to remember we're the public facing part of this, right? And I think we were the guinea pig face. Like, so they brought, like, they took everything up a notch higher. Um, they used social media to see how people would respond. They kind of gauged what was working, what is not working. They're still kind of doing that. They're like, let's see what happens if we leak this video. Let's see how people respond. Let's see if they make CG balloon figures to try to excuse the video. Um, so um, my point is, I think that is the very public phase, but behind the scenes, things are still happening. I um, remember, and this isn't like a hugely known thing, that Lou was at the hearing. Um, he wasn't sitting um, out there. He wasn't trying to draw attention away from the hearing. He was there behind the scenes and I ran into him and he was very busy. So this is all very much the public face of the phases. Um, I do think that we have to keep in mind that there might be a sense of urgency about getting this out so people will be prepared because science is um, going to space, of course, um, and rapidly improving. So it may not be up to us what the next phase is. It might be um, very much up to NHI when they want to disclose. And I suspect that they do, actually. Um, from what I've heard from experiencers and from my own experiences, I think that will be the next public phase. 
Yeah, yeah, I just got a message from my hometown in New York of another another thing that looked like Aguadilla. Um, just just the other night, uh, somebody sent me that on Friday night because we did my high school show uh, a couple of weeks ago where I had six different witnesses from my high school that that had sightings from from the the nineteen eighties Hudson Valley thing. So yeah, nice, Vinny. <laughs> I don't know what the next phase is going to look like. I think, as Deb and a few others mentioned there, there is obviously still a lot of great work being done behind the scenes. But I think one thing we're seeing, and it does seem to be like we're in a bit of a down period here, is that there's frustration, which always comes around. A great example I looked on X earlier today, and you see this video of Kurt Jai Mungle saying that he's dismayed with the subject because we haven't had the any of the whistleblowers coming forward and that. And look, that's okay. It's okay to feel dismay, but at the same time, I think what people need to realize is that we've got to, we can't just sit and wait for information to always be handed to us. I would use these down times or this pre phase to look back in the historical record, look at the work people like Graham Rendell are doing, who are finding incredible multi faceted data based cases from the 40s and 50s that just amplify what we've been talking about in the last 20 years cases that we really focus on now go back and correlate these cases from blue book that can be cross-referenced with the uk ministry of defense files there is so much work that can still be done rather than sitting on x complaining about well nothing's been brought to us recently so i'm a bit dismayed no offense to kurt jai mungle but still work to do <laughs> he's not interested in doing that work <laughs> Um, hey, each, yeah. each to their own, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Charlotte. Um, so I'm going to go with Lou said, uh, what if it's not mankind? It's mankind's. Maybe it's not phase four, it's phase fours. Because where we're at with phase four is not where the general public or non interested people, you know, are at. So I think that's worth considering. You know, we can't like generalize and say everyone's at the same point. So, you know, what our phase four is, is totally different. Phase four for the public might be like, oh, it's actually real, you know, maybe they're not there yet. So, you know, uh, but on that, I wanted to say, don't lose hope. Today, I received from one of my piano students, this little, I don't know if you can see, UFO. We can't. Oh, it's a little UFO bookmark. It's got a little Aww. UFO on my name. <laughs> And we're getting like, there like charlotte himself. i'm giving him a shout out because he might be watching he's mega into it so nice one louis that's all awesome. lincoln shares own love that dan <laughs> so firstly if everyone could just not mention the six nations that'd be great it didn't happen this year <laughs> wales didn't come <laughs> it was brilliant football. loved it <laughs> <laughs> I, I will say in Wales's defense that we have a thing called a, a love spoon, which is a wooden spoon carved in a way. So in rugby, when they're like, yeah, the worst team gets the wooden spoon, we're like, oh, it's a very loving thing to give someone. It's not a loss at all, you know? So that's that's why we accept the wooden spoon more, more than most people. Um, so when it comes to the phases, I would say we, we've all kind of, we've been lulled into a false sense of security that there's order in this community. Since 2017, we've actually had a direction. We've actually all been pulling in that same direction. And the natural state of this community is absolute chaos with people running in different directions with their hair on fire and screaming that they know different facts and saying they definitely know where things are from and it's definitely X and definitely Y and so on and so forth. So the the phases, you know, phase one, two, three, uh, to use Andy's kind of parlance there, it's all very focused. It's working towards a very clear goal, you know, going from just absolute 90s ufology to, to something clearer and with more of a of a goal and more energy um, and more in the scientific process. I, I think that's that's an interesting change there. But we've absolutely kind of hit, just like Marvel, this place where essentially too many things are being added, too many claims, too many storylines that aren't followed up. It feels a bit rudderless and directionless. Um, and instead it's just kind of like, I'm here. And that's annoying when it comes to watching a Marvel movie because you're like, well, where is it going? I wanna, I wanna kind of know where the phase is going. But when it comes to UFOs set in the baseline of it's here, now what? That's, that's a really potent change in the conversation because we're looking at how it's affecting us as humanity as we kind of reach out into the cosmos and things like that. 
so essentially we're, we're probably going to see a bit of a reset of what Lou Alexander refers to as the five pillars where you know the political conversation and the public conversation and so on and so forth all has to kind of be in line with each other instead of each one kind of running out at different speeds and getting a bit too far ahead of itself um so that'll kind of be pulled a bit more in line then it's communicating with the world kind of what we have the data we have the things we know that's public hearings you know that's the reports from arrow that's the work SEU you were doing and putting out you know for peer review uh, saying like look there's legit stuff here the scientists can come and apply themselves to this is no longer the realm of just woo and pseudoscience where we're actually doing work and then we've got to remember that all of these phases they they kind of came from left field you know what lou and chris are doing that was something that they sat in a restaurant and kind of sketched out on the back of the napkin and figured out you know even the mcu and how they built those movies that was probably you know a bunch of creative sat in a room having a bunch of donuts and coffee in the morning sketching on the back of a napkin again these things that look like these big deep plans to us are often just you know people just trying their best to keep the wheels on for as long as they can and getting their little cart down the road and i think that's kind of what we're in here the left field disruption here is likely to be stuff like private industry going to space uh you know to the moon kind of maybe getting footage of things that we have kind of heard uh, up there but we've never seen footage of um and as well as that the consciousness studies with psychedelics and things like that knowing consciousness ourselves our brains that's going to be a kind of left field so yeah the, the next phase is going to get real weird i think but the underlying feeling of this is that and it's been mentioned already everyone's waiting for the u.s government but we have to remember you don't have to wait for the avengers to show up to do some heroic so let's get on with it Right on, brother. Yeah, and I'm brother. so I'm so glad those guys had the uh, the rollerball pen for the back of the napkin, Nathan. You have the felt tip pen, then you're tearing the napkin. We lose it. The Bryce Zabel thing happens, you know, like at his house. It uh, okay, total disaster. Yeah, um, well, this is an excellent question, and it's funny because uh, the liminal frames episode that comes out later tonight, we're talking about the disclosure aspects and different kinds of disclosure. So this brings that conversation to mind for me particularly the difference between what we've heard of as controlled disclosure and catastrophic disclosure, as if these are the only two options, right? And I think that really what we're kind of seeing is a combination of both. We're seeing a little bit of control uh, along with a little bit of chaos and that you've got government sort of saying a little bit here and there. I mean, sh the Schumer Amendment still stands out as a really profound piece of legislation that was incredibly detailed. And if what we're hearing uh, you know, from people like Danny Sheehan, which I know we can talk about separately, but if what we're hearing from him is true, that that is getting a reboot and is going to be introduced again, that really does lend further credence to the fact that that there's some very serious people who haven't given up on this and are going to continue pushing that forward. So that represents a very controlled effort to try to get in charge of this and, and disseminate the information. On the other hand, the chaotic elements are things like whistleblowers who set forward without anyone's permission, which certainly could happen. Rob, you alluded to that. So I think that is a very real possibility. Um, I think the NHI themselves could be quite chaotic. However, they decide to make themselves known or whatever sightings may come forward. But, you know, keep in mind, we live in a very kind of strange time period, right? Where all this information is surrounding us constantly makes it very difficult for us to kind of weave together a very cohesive narrative about the world. We're all really kind of taking pieces from our different spheres of interest and we're we're putting together this patchwork of what we think the story of reality happens to be. There's less of a cohesive sort of meta narrative that we used to have in the world. Um, and I think that that is continuing to, to you know, proceed. We're getting all these different means of uh, creating content and it's diff more difficult, more difficult and difficult to parse truth from reality. I think that's going to continue to be the case as we see advances in AI. So it's a, uh, you know, it's going to be chaotic in that regard in terms of what is real and what is not real and uh, i think it's going to make this even more challenging as we continue to observe what might take place over the next several years okay. another great answer to a great question andy <laughs> to say that that provoke provoke thought would be an understatement um i yeah, think Courtney. we need and then we can I'm say goodbye to Vinny. so i just want to give her a chance real quick okay i was okay yeah i'm sorry go ahead court was there timing? Did you want to do something else first? Uh, no, I mean, you could go ahead we, and we'll try to see if we can get Vinny to throw his topic in there before he goes. I didn't realize he had a timeline as well, but go ahead. Go ahead, ma'am. 
you know, I'm not going to be able to say anything that everybody else hasn't said. So I'll just echo what everybody else said and just say that, you know, I, I have worked with a couple of whistleblowers. So that's something new that I can offer in this conversation is that I just saw this last week that uh, Matt Laszlo said, you know, uh, that there might be another hearing coming. And that was whispered, you know, but not necessarily confirmed. It's still not completely confirmed. But I think that will help us go into the next phase out of this chaotic period into a more um, disclosure rooted in legislation, hopefully, maybe some field hearings. The second thing is, is that um, when I was at the Soul Symposium, one of the things that really one of my biggest takeaways was listening to Hal put off in that Q&A with Leslie Keene. And, um, you know, he said he did the survey you know, back way back when in the early 2000s and that it was overwhelmingly negative. He was surprised that it was overwhelmingly negative against disclosure and that one of the main crucial uh, linchpins in that was because of the IRAD money and that the U.S. government was never going to do a disclosure, that they didn't have control over the narrative. So when you walk away from that, hearing that, knowing they were testing, doing litmus tests on disclosure and what it would look like and through these surveys, positive and negative values and where that would um, come into a cumulative value, whether it, whether it would be positive to go forward or not. So I think that the IRAD money is a major huge hang up in all of this, very technically about the money and how it was spent. But I do think that there's positive, a positive side to this in that Congress is now somewhat read in to have the right kind of questions going into these next hearings about the money, because that seems to be one of the biggest issues that they're they're on about is the the you know the DOD and where this money is going. So I think the next period, if we don't get controlled disclosure, will will transition. And I do think NHI will have something to do with it. Somebody just sent me a screenshot from Colonel Nell's um, you know, talk at the symposium that NHI was a part of that. And so if you think about this 10 years ago, that that was not even part of the public discourse around around disclosure. So I think we're definitely in a, a wait and see and a holding pattern. And, you know, I really like what Vinny said about going back and kind of recasting some of the old stuff. I also think there's still work to do about the hearing. One of the things I've picked up on and reading the transcripts, transcripts was about David Grush saying that there was signals traffic that came in from the U.S. and Russia and that that came through and was declassified. So that's one of the things I'm trying to follow up on just as a real world action step that we can take in the research community to get that traffic. It had to do with the US treaty and the nuclear treaty and he gave us breadcrumbs. So I'm trying to also look at the breadcrumbs and you know do due diligence in the meantime, in this period. We don't call her Courtney connected for nothing. That's all I got to tell you, all right? <laughs> exactly. Well, we're going to see uh, say goodbye to Andy real quick, and then and Vinny as well. So Andy, go, go right ahead. Bye. <laughs> Andy, you can do yeah, better than that. Here. You said real quick. Um, <laughs> Not uh, that quick. Bye, everyone. Not uh, cheers. Um, <laughs> I, 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 make, I don't do, do all this hands on. and all that stuff. I don't do that. Um, do what? Sorry, Rob. Speak English. Do a make. Do yeah. Do a make West. Your dinner's on. Hard question, he leaves. Oh, well, basically, yeah. Do not make question a lot of great work for the UFO topic. God bless him. So, yeah. Um, listen, can I just give a little, little bit of advice to leave on, DJ? Because you like that kind of stuff, but you speak better yes, than sir. me. A lot of people mentioning on here and online, like X, Twitter, social media, all that kind of stuff, the UFO conversation doesn't go away if you leave social media or don't log on to Twitter for the day. Um you can still enjoy the UFO topic and conversation by not getting involved in all that stuff online. Uh, so don't let other people's opinions, you know, listen to everyone's opinion, but make up your own mind is really good advice that Scott Hall, the famous WWF guy, gave everyone. Um, and I think that's the best way to go about the, the UFO conversation is just listen to people's opinions, but you don't have to let it influence you. Just because I say something or Dan does or, or DJ or Lou Elizondo or Chris Mellon or Green Street or or anyone else, that's fine. Listen to an opinion, but you can make up your own mind and not feel sad or anxious or happy or whatever about it. Just take it for what it is and kind of move on because the conversation is going to move on regardless. You might as well try and enjoy it a little bit along the way. So, I, I, I believe uh, Kesha said it best. Don't let the bastards bring you down. 
it, it, that's yeah. great advice. I mean, sometimes, like I said earlier, you got to just go with your gut because you are hear, hearing all these things and you have to figure out not what you want to believe, but necessarily what feels the most true to you and for what reasons. And once you can justify it to yourself, you don't have to justify it to anybody else. So thank you, Andy, so much for uh, joining us. I do do that hand thing. Namaste. I'm a yogi. So that's not going anywhere uh, just because that's part of me. In fact, I'm doing a yoga circle tomorrow some other teachers but thank you so much andy it's been a pleasure uh having you back on the show and uh, i hope it's uh that you come back soon thank and you can i just say time. one thing dj yes sir um, please i do know and i hate the coming soon stuff but next week there is a huge whistleblower coming forward and i'll just say the name now so people yeah <laughs> <laughs> ah! <laughs> Come on. I was hoping he was gonna pump something that's coming up on his show on that UFO podcast. But Andy's got a great sense of humor, man. Damn that boy, good. Vinny, go with your topic, man. All right, man. I'm gonna start this one out with a quote from Julius Caesar: "Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears." My topic is. I want to hear about any success stories that any of you may have had when talking with friends and families about the UFO subject. You know, when we're always scared to bring it up with those closest to us, sometimes you're pleasantly surprised by the reaction you get and that people are really indulgent and they want to talk about it. So let me know of any su successes. I will take this off air and I will leave you with a, a quote from Romeo and Juliet. Parting is such sweet sorrow. <laughs> Thanks, drop Mike. that mic baby i love that all right let's reset rob, that uh, for us nathan yeah let's go to rob on this one great reset question. it for me what, what was it again nathan uh so we got rob you deb no i mean this question so I... <laughs> you want me to restate his question yes so he was asking about success stories of sharing you're talking about the uap phenomena with like friends family whatever yeah thank you uh during my lunch break in work two of my staff came to me separately when the David Grush story came out and they, they were talking about it and I was kind of earwigging. And I said, oh yeah, David Grush, I know about David Grush, blah, 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 blah. And they were like, what do you know? And I literally sat down with them for about an hour and a half and laid everything out on the table. And now to this day, they're still at me, what's going on, what's going on, what's going on? So th th this is a generation, I'm 46, they're 25, 26 years of age. And for me to hear that generation of kids as well, my youngest, well, my eldest is 23. Um, they're into it. They're discussing it. They're chatting it like my staff team. And uh, for me, that's a success story because they're asking me questions. They're continuing the conversation. They're not hiding in the corner, you know, looking at me as if I'm wearing a tinfoil hat. But the beauty of where we're at in terms of the phase that we're at is, which I'm really passionate about, is the, the evidence-based discussion that's around this conversation and the level of individuals that are coming forward that are very well that are sacrificed that are sacrificed so much um for the cause in terms of the communication around it um, and to be able to explain that to people and for them to sit back and go wow this is this is interesting and um, without raising their eyes to heaven it's it's great it's great to hear and having kids talk about it at the dinner table um, and to ask me questions about it, um, it's fascinating. It's fascinating. The world is smaller. We're a lot more educated. We're a, more, a lot more inclusive. And we understand the bigger world now, and we understand our place in it, I think. Um, and I think it's created some kind of feeling of people feeling a little bit humble. But I'm, I'm delighted to see my kids are talking about it and they're sharing it with their friends. I'm known as the UFO guy in the house, but not in a funny way, but in a, in a very sort of hungry way for information and they're always asking me questions so the fact that people are still asking me questions and coming to me in a serious manner i think that's a success story in itself because i think having these conversations outside of what we're doing now having these conversations outside the world of twitter and x, as, as gary said disclosure is not going to happen via the internet or on x it's going to happen having conversations in your communities having conversations in your universities and your schools in the pub with your friends around the dinner table, that's how it's going to happen because now you're creating information, you're creating a new norm, a new dialect, new narrative. And I think that's, it's great to be having these conversations. So for me, that's a success story. Long, 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 long answer. <laughs>
Oh, that's a great one. Yeah, really, yeah. really good. Um, DJ. Is anyone else upset that Rob doesn't look 46? Because I am. Okay? <laughs> that, that's yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> it's the uh, Irish I'm water. Having, <laughs> I'm having a very <laughs> Irish water. I love it, baby. And Irish Guinness, right? Um, I'm having a, very, a, a pretty easy time with this because I, I had to pitch this to my hometown to get experiencers to come out. So I just made like a PowerPoint slide and it said basically – um, this legislation from 2021 and 2022 and 2023 and 2024, bipartisan support in Congress, uh, David Fravor, uh, Lou Elizondo, uh, Ryan Graves, Alex Dietrich, blah, blah, blah. So I just made this PowerPoint slide. So this is a real thing. And I don't, I am not really getting pushback from almost anybody about this. Um, I am when it comes to Bigfoot. When you start talking about Bigfoot, people look at you like you're nuts. It doesn't exist. It's a myth. And But with UFOs, I'm really not having that issue because I can just make all these bullet points. And then uh, what, do, what are they going to say? You know, Congress just made up this legislation about something fake <laughs> from both sides. Because it doesn't, you know, you're either one side or the other in the U.S. You can't be both unless you're me. Um, and so uh, they can't, you know, their favorite senator may have supported this or at least their side of the aisle had passed. So anyway, that for me, it's it's really not an issue. Love it. Thanks, DJ. Deb. I have um, a mixed bag with this one. When it comes to my family, they're pretty condescending still. So I wouldn't call it a success story, although my dad did buy me a UFO book for Christmas. Um, but when it comes to my coworkers, I have some success because they have different cultural experiences. So they're able to bring that to the conversation and I'm able to learn something from them and um, they learn something from what I know about the topic. Um, and that really broadens the way to think about this. Like, so for instance, um, my coworkers, the ones that are closest to me in my office, neither of them um, would be considered Western culture. So they have a very different view of this. And I want to throw out there also that my kids are like me. When I've talked to them about that, they're just shrug and they're like, okay, they're real, not a big deal to them. And there's a lot of people who do still have that perspective and it's not shocking. It's just part of nature. And my kids are like, I am with this, like, because maybe because I'm not an alarmist <laughs> about this topic. Um, and I think that if people present it as it's a normal thing, it's not that big a deal. Like, it's, you know, just another species, possibly maybe 50 species. We don't know. But there's a lot of species we don't know about. So, yeah, we're we still trying to understand where DJ came from. That's true. <laughs> 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 All right, Charlotte. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think I've had like three different experiences, like uh, parents level. Um, I think my mum said the other week, oh, no, I don't believe it at all. <laughs> so I was like, oh, great. Right. OK. What have I been, even been talking about? But she buys me the books. So bless her. Um, then you get to like my friends level. We're 46 as well. I think Vinny's in the same school year. So Rob, Vinny and me. Yeah. Doing all right. All of you um, beautiful souls and peoples. It's, it's where we live, you see, clearly. Um, so, yeah, my friends are just like, oh, right, really interesting. Do you think, you know, the government's covered it up? So they're asking the right questions. They're thinking about, right, this is a real thing. Um, and then when you get to kids that I teach through piano, like I said, the guy that I mentioned, you know, he was like, he brought up Area 51, you know. And then I've had other little girls, eight, you know, bring up aliens and stuff. So it's just in their psyche. So I don't think it'll be a problem to them. So just really different generationally. Probably that's an overgeneralization. I'm sure there's a lot more weirder 70 and 80 year olds that are into that kind of thing. But for my own family and immediate circle, that's how it's been, really. So my friends are quite like, oh, you're into that, Charlotte. That's interesting. So that's good. They don't think I'm all mental. So hopefully. You're definitely not. No, that's that's really, really good. Um <laughs> Yeah, it's definitely changing. Dan, what, what about you? Have you got uh, some stories a lot like that? Yeah, so I, I used to work, the one that stands out to me, I used to work in a bar. And I've got my phone set up with this this kind of Skywatch app that will let you know when the space station's going over. And what I used to do is I used to ring the bell and just tell everyone to get off their asses and come outside with me and watch the space station. 
most people didn't even know we had a space station. And when they saw this bright light coming up, predicted to the minute by my phone and, you know, me, their, their minds are just dribble at that moment. And the conversation inevitably always turned to, and it wasn't me bringing it up, just being in the presence of something that they didn't understand that was up in the sky that was really bright and was new to them and expanded their horizons, they'd say, oh, I guess that's how a UFO looks then, or something like that. And then they'd start talking about it, about weird things that they'd seen and things like that. And I always saw it as my job to just kind of stand outside that conversation and just sprinkling questions that would really kind of stoke their curiosity. So, for example, you, you know, people will talk about aliens, but if you just say to them, well, what if it's not aliens? What else could it be? That's an hour long conversation you can then just sit and watch <laughs> and just hear what they come up with in their heads because they've never thought about that before. I love the movie Nope for this. Everyone wanted this just weird Skinwalker Ranch, normal, you know, grazing a UFO movie. But what it did is, you know, millions and millions and millions of people went to see that film and it made them think, what if this is a form of rare life? What if this is life in the atmosphere that can swim around and we think of it as flying and it's just something different? It's thinking outside the box a bit. And, and I feel like that's what we need to guide. We're, we're kind of, I don't know, stewards for, for seeding that curiosity um, without being overbearing. You know, we, we all kind of recognize that blank look that happens in people's eyes when they've clearly had enough of the conversation and you just got to kind of go, okay, I'll just walk away now and just leave you to think about that for a second. Um, something else that always comes up for me as well when I'm talking to people about it is I always go in with the expectation that they kind of know the world in the same way as I do. And I feel like I've learned that that's really dangerous because even my next door neighbor lives in a different world to me. And what I mean by that is uh, you guys have no doubt come across three body problem. It was on Netflix, right? And a big part of the, the conversation in the show is about particle accelerators. We're all nerds. We are, we're just nerds. Um, so we know that particle accelerators are real things. You, you know, we know that there's some weird physics that goes on and they're trying to figure out what they do and they're searching for the God particle and all of these really profound questions. Meanwhile, my next door neighbor literally said to me, I didn't know a particle accelerator actually existed. I thought it was just a sci-fi thing. And that to me is such a basic, you know, discrepancy from how I think of the world that that alone kind of melts their head. So you kind of have to allow for those different spaces that people live in. And, and that's where I think is so rich about letting the person talk to you about it and you just ask them questions because the expectation is you're just gonna be a bit overbearing with it. I also find it really interesting when you talk to children about it. And a number of people have, have spoken to this. Children just seem to be, I don't know what it is. It's like there's there's a filter they don't have that there's this selfishness that hasn't developed in them yet. And I know children can be mean in really kind of you know shallow ways, like calling names and things like that. But ultimately, every child that I've come across that talks about this always talks about well, they'll be our friends then, right? The star people will be our friends. And that's so encouraging to hear because the, that's the future generation that's actually going to be talking with, with the other species and, you know, making the decisions that currently Elon Musk is making with SpaceX and Tesla and things like that. These are the kids that when they grow up and they become politicians, we're going to start, you know, getting real, real kind of baseline put down because it's not that crazy. And uh, I'll stop there because... The next thing I want to say is is kind of my question, so I won't ruin it. But just remember, you know, there is so much weirdness in the world that when someone says, oh, we can't tell you the UFO news, we can't talk about UFOs because it's scary. We tell kids that God will smite them and send them to hell. We tell kids that Jesus was nailed to a goddamn cross. That's in Sunday school. We tell kids that Santa will judge them and not bring them gifts for the rest of their life. We tell kids the giant bunnies come into the room and gives them chocolate eggs. We tell <laughs> kids a lot of terror, terrible, 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 scary things. And we grow up with it. So we just have to be more compassionate to each other, ask questions and just help people walk down this path in, in a really solid way that they kind of lead the way. Um, a friend once said to me after a conversation, and I thought this was a, a resounding success because he's such a skeptic. We had a conversation that was all about just questions and curiosity. And at the end of it, he said to me, okay, well now what? Can you wake me up when uh, when they actually show up? I've got work to go to. 
you know what? It kind of sucks that he wasn't jumping in as, as a geek as, as deep as we are, but that's that's acceptance, right? That's what acceptance would look for, like for most people on the planet. Fine, okay, whatever, but I've got to go to work in the morning. That's great. <laughs> that's not panic. That's not rioting. You, you know, that's that's what we need to aim for, I think. Dan, that is a, yeah. a brilliant answer, and you've made me think about this whole issue where you know, for someone who's a non-parent that talking to a child about it, I would feel like I would need to ask the parents and, and based on the, the examples that you laid out outside of the tooth fairy and Rudolph, um, I, I, I would feel like I would need to ask them, but maybe, but the, the examples that you laid out, maybe you shouldn't because it's analogous to those other, uh, those, those other very sort of hor uh, horrific stories that are part of our history. So really interesting, Dan. Um, so we got to get to have who, who else has to answer Nathan, who, who else has left up on this? Cause I don't think Rob, Charlotte or Dan have given their topics. Am I correct? That is correct. I was going to suggest in the interest of time that, uh, the cabby hosts sort of recuse ourselves from yeah. you know, responses and give our, our guests a chance to introduce their topics. And Rob, Absolutely. you are next. Um, so if you wouldn't mind, uh, share with, sure. us, share with us what you yeah. got. Yeah, well, Andy asked my question, so I had to think of one quick and fast. But I'm curious to, like, I've, I've had conversations with people and um, some people that have worked in the DOD, some people who haven't, some scientists and whatever. And I asked the question, what are these things? Like, why are they here? Is it a case of they're just popping in and out of dimensions because they're bending space and time using negative gravity? Um, it's like crossing busy traffic on a motorway. Um, or looking at their behaviors around military complexes, military bases. Uh, is this a recon mission? Are there different species of these things? If they do, do they have different motivations? Um, and the answer that I'm getting from people is that they don't know what these are. They don't know what their intent is. <laughs> and it goes back to you, Courtney, in terms of what you were saying there about the NHI, in terms of maybe they could present themselves and maybe that's the case and maybe that's another particular cohort of, of NHI I don't know but I always like to ask the question why what are they doing here now I know the answer around why are we spotting these things more because our technology is better we're up in the sky more and so on and so forth the world is getting smaller the reporting mechanisms are much better but why what are they why are they visiting us? Um, are they interested in our military? Are they interested in how we respond to them? Are they testing us from a, a recon point of view, checking our weaknesses? Um, I don't know. That's my question to you guys. What, what are your theories? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I'd like to go to Charlotte on that first. What, what, what do you think, Charlotte? Um, I would like to throw it back to Rob and say, <laughs> are they visiting us? Hmm. You know, are they coming from somewhere else or are they part of our actual reality in some way we can't get? Are they part True, of True, good. Or, uh, yeah, I mean, you know? have, they been, have they been here the whole time and because we're, in an Irish expression, fecking up our oceans, <laughs> are they kind of going, oh, here, this is, will you just stop, you know? Um, yeah, are they coming I, I, or is it just something that's always around and like we're, we're around, sure. they're around, we just notice them now, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Is it the fishbowl effect? You know, are, are yeah. they just putting their hand in the water and where the fish kind of go, oh, what's that? Yeah. And there's a, there's a bigger, there's a bigger reality around us that we don't Are they asking why are we visiting them? Yeah, exactly. And who are these monkeys with the matches? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Those are great, great, great questions. And Dan, I, I want you to jump in on this too. But Dan, I'm watching the clock, Dan. I'm watching it. So <laughs> I'll try and keep it. Concise. Gravity is the this, key. This is a really big question, isn't it? Big. And so the I'm, I'm just, I'm going to try for like a little, a little left field again. Um, so I can cover a slightly different kind of, yeah. So at a base level, I think curiosity is what is taking place. You know, we, we sent something to Mars and we named it curiosity. And we, when we look out of the universe, we look for life as we know it, life that reflects us, the stuff that we know. So, in my kind of limited monkey brain way, uh, at a basic level, I think they're just as curious as us, as us as we are about them. But then to kind of go a little wider with it, um, I, I really love what Kiel talks about, The a better question for the phenomena is not why are they here, but why aren't they leaving us alone? 
And <laughs> it seems like we are being dragged, kicking and screaming as a species through an education towards knowing deeply, grokking and understanding that we are not alone, that we are part of a bigger universe, that we're kind of messing up. I wonder sometimes, you know, there, there's a conversation where people talk about the structure of the universe compared to the structure of brains and how the universe kind of resembles neurons and, and how things kind of ideas get passed around in your brain and so on and so forth. And ever since seeing that, part of me is fascinated with the idea of fractals. And, and when we talk dimensions, really, we're talking about bigger things and smaller things. Um, you know, to a bacteria, we're in another dimension. It's not, we haven't gone through a portal, um, but, you know, we, we've kind of built an instrument to allow us to see something that we couldn't see before. You know, a, a telescope or a microscope is almost a dimensional window for us, you know, it's something we can't see with our eyes. So I wonder if, you know, if the earth is a molecule of something and we are so small that we are part of this bigger process, is us going into space messing up the kind of overall kind of process and balance of the universe so for example let's kind of draw more energy than we need to uh is that kind of throwing this whole ecosystem out of balance the bigger ecosystem that we're not aware of yet almost like a bad cell in a chain right if we carry on reaching out into the cosmos is that going to mess things up for the universe around us uh it's interesting to think about you know we we'd never when we look at an ant an ant doesn't recognize us as another life form uh it just kind of sees you know the bottom of my shoe or whatever it doesn't know what a shoe is it doesn't know what industry is so on and so forth so we kind of have to again get out of those comfy boxes um i will defer to bashar on this bashar is a channeler and i would recommend everyone go listen to him because he's got some great self-help stuff whether you believe in channeling or not but when talking about the tic tac uh, this has always stuck with me. He, he spoke about the Tic Tac. Someone said, what is the reason for the Tic Tac being here, Bashar? Tell us. And Bashar said, "There is the reason for them being here is nothing more than look at us, wake up, and see your place in the universe. And I think that's probably true. Love that. Love that. Um, Brilliant answers, Dan. Did, did, we, did we touch on Did we get everybody's response on that? I think everybody had a chance yes, to jump in on it. Okay, excellent. Um, uh, Charlotte, I'd love to get your, your topic before we... We go to Dan for his. Oh, this is so hard. It's like I've got three. I've got a really good one, but it's a bit negative, so I might go for a positive one. Um, <laughs> I keep banging on about these um, UFOs that I studied um, with UFO identified in the UK, which were the kind of blobby, plasma-looking, tumbling bean sort of variety shape, which sort of seemed to stay maybe low altitude for like 40 minutes ish and then they seem to zip off but no one ever gets video of them doing that they just they look like a plastic bag but maybe self-illuminating but they seem to be stuck in one place for too long for something you know debris type stuff what do people think they could be you know i've heard things like oh plasma in the air but when you read about plasmas they seem to be much higher up in the atmosphere you don't seem to get them lower in the atmosphere that you would see them so clearly um so i've read about einstein rosen bridges you know wormholes what does anybody else think if they're familiar with this type of ufo that is often not depicted in the shapes i have to say mm -hmm. yeah i love this question mm -hmm. rob I don't know. I had a conversation with a chemist about a year ago, Jack Starfatti, if everybody knows him. Uh, interesting, colorful guy who just insults you completely. But um, <laughs> I, 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 yeah, never been so insulted in my life uh, for not understanding quantum physics. I think the answer was, is in actual quantum physics. I think the, the answer is there. I think what what you could be seeing is a byproduct of the propulsion system that's being used. Um, I think that when gravity, which takes a lot of energy and a lot of mass to create and to turn that into negative gravity, I think what that does is it changes the space and manipulates the space around the object um, that is at the center of it. And I think it gives off that radiation and it bends the light, as it were, uh, diffracts the light and creates this plasma look about it. Um, and I think 
there might be different models to different technologies. And I have a theory that what we're seeing is different. It's almost like you have a different sports car and you have the Mark one, two and three of that sports car. And I think what we're seeing, if, if the quantum physics is right, if it's there, if I'm understanding it in theory, that what we're seeing is pockets of different time coming into our time. And what you're seeing is saucers, you're seeing Tic Tacs, which is the sport model, which is the new version model coming in from its future. And what we're seeing in the Roswell is its past. And they're moving back and forth, back and forth. That's what I think. Um, and I also think that the these plasma looking um, objects are possibly another version of that. That's just my my view. But it's a thought experiment, so it's open to everybody's opinion. Yeah, no, fabulous. Uh, Dan, you've not thought about orbs before, have you? <laughs> Never. No, it's completely new this morning <laughs> after toast. <laughs> so this this question brings to mind Kiel again. Kiel uh, studied UFOs and, and kind of came up with two categories that he'd look at: hard UFOs and soft UFOs. So many of the, the reports are what he calls soft UFOs, which is, as Charlotte said, is this fuzzy thing by nature. Um, when we see photos of, of UFOs and they're kind of fuzzy and you can't get a picture of them, uh, it always makes me think, you know, if it's just fuzzy, it's going to be fuzzy in a picture, right? So by its very nature, it's hard to photograph. And that is low observability. That's one of the five observables. So that totally makes sense there. Um, yeah, bad in photos, hard to capture. These kind of things are what I think of as possibly rare life forms. You know, if we talk about ball lightning a lot and science likes to act like it has a handle on ball lightning. It doesn't. Just the term ball lightning is kind of this miracle term that no one really knows right. anything about. We don't know <laughs> what makes it. When you look into it uh, and you kind of find the, the, different, the different processes in the world that allow kind of, you know, these light balls to form, uh, they, they look at kind of things called piezo electric effect where rocks under different pressure can kind of cause light to, to form if anyone knows the uh, there's a type of shrimp that hits its prey so hard that it creates light in the the kind of the vacuum of the punch i think it's called super cavitation imagine being able to hit that hard that's crazy nature is nuts but um you know they, there are all these kind of natural processes that to us at some point would have looked supernatural or something other, which is just nature now, you, you know, um, it's not supernatural, it's nature. Uh, Lou Alessandro likes to say, you know, at the edge of the map, they used to draw a giant squid and say a monster's there. Now we're just like a giant squid's there. Can you calm down? Like, it's fine. Just go sail through it. It's not a problem. Um, so apart from rare life forms, the, the really out there kind of thing that it makes me think of is that in the past hundred years, science has moved from something that considers space-time the medium that we're in and thinking of matter as there, no matter who's observing it, to realizing that the universe is more probabilistic. And what that means is there's a bunch of possibilities that all exist until it's interacted with and then the waveform collapse and voila, you have what you and I call our reality. But there's that wonderful question, isn't there, of if a tree falls in the forest and there's no one around to hear it, does it make a sound? Not only does it not make a sound, it seems like it doesn't exist until we look at it. So I wonder if these kind of fuzzy gray blobs are less there and is they, they're more something that's a possibility that's kind of trying to manifest through, you know, thought forms and kind of that, that area, or whether it's just something that's almost coming into being. And just to throw in an interesting word into that, like something almost coming into being, you, you'd kind of say that it may be secreting into our reality from somewhere else. Mm -hmm. um, it's no accident that Tom DeLonge called his series secret machines. They are secreting machines. That that Aguadilla object really reminds me of what Charlotte and, and what Dan were talking about, the way it's yeah. kind of mm -hmm. shape-shifting as it's moving along. Yeah, it really reminds tumbling. me of that. I was just uh, going to say, do, sorry, if, if I could. I, I was going to say Dan's yeah. money was well spent at Eaton and at Oxford. That's all I got to say, Charlotte. Yeah, Go ahead, <laughs> yeah amazing. Um, I, think, I think Dan's right as well because um, <laughs> just to add that when we were studying one of the sightings from right near me, um, the guy saw it because he marked on his calendar 
that a year ago because a year ago he'd seen something so he put on april the 22nd on earth day look for ufos so he went and looked in his garden and that's what he saw so so, so he spent a year focusing his intuition trying to manifest a ufo sighting and that is just what we call ce5 right I, I guess so wow. yeah yeah he's not into that kind of thing he's like into football and stuff you know but he's an excellent yeah. control in the experiment yeah exactly. wait and andy's great, great. proof you can be into football and ufos right <laughs> yeah, of course you can i'm not and saying you can't Obviously. and rugby i'm glad we didn't have a dust up with with a, a rugby with uh, robin and andy but uh <laughs> could have been dangerous uh all right well dan you just spoke but i want to give you the final topic floor here so uh, throw it out, and then uh, maybe we'll all get a quick chance to jump in as we, as we also say goodbye to everybody. Sure thing. So uh, I found you a Shakespeare quote to sign off with, which I'll leave to the end, by the way. Um, but so Carl Sagan said this thing that we hear so much to the point where it's really annoying. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. When he said that, we didn't know about exoplanets. We now regularly see pictures from the James Webb telescope and find exoplanets. You know, we've gone from zero, which is what Carl Sagan was dealing with when he claimed that, uh, to 5,600. There are currently 10,000 candidates we're looking through. So there'll be thousands more in there. And that's not even considering, you know, there are 100 billion stars and 100 billion galaxies and all the planets that could be in these spaces, you know? So what I wanted to ask each of you is in the modern day, we're, we're very used to planets being out there, Goldilocks zones being out there, water being on other planets, and so on and so forth. So is it true that it is, or it should be considered an extraordinary claim that life is elsewhere in the universe anymore? Or is it just matter, you know, very kind of common sense thing to, to wonder about now? I love this question. Um, all right, Rob, let's go to you first. <sighs> That's a, that's a hard answer. We should be doing this in the pub, lads. Um, <laughs> yeah. I'm up. I should, I should have had a few points to be able to answer that, Dan. Um, <laughs> oh, <laughs> uh, what, okay, what was the question again? Is it, is it ex is, extraordinary to ask if there's life out there? Uh, basically, yeah. Is, is it extraordinary anymore? Do we need extraordinary evidence or do we just need normal evidence? Is it a I, very logical claim to make? I think we're past that at this stage. I think we really are. I think it's it, it's naive not to be asking that question. And I don't like that extraordinary claim means extraordinary evidence or needs extra. I, I don't believe that's the case because we're expanding all the time. The universe is bigger than we ever thought it was. It's expanding. It's growing all the time. And statistically, probability, there has to be. I think what's what's crazy is that that we, well, what's stopping us from from, from actually Seeing that is the technology that that we don't have, you know, to be able to to go out and visit these areas or to be able to manipulate time and space to to cut through the fat and get from one area to another. Um, I no, I, I don't I don't think that's the case. I I think it's extraordinary that we're not asking these questions and i think it's extraordinary that we're not receiving or some of us are in receipt of those and accepting of those questions and um, you know i i'm humble enough to to say that we are not the center of the universe we are not and um, and what we're experiencing at the moment is a sure example of that and i i just think it's extraordinary that we're not asking those questions that's all that's all i can say to be honest and um, yeah i think it's naive that, that we're, we're not having this conversation. And I think it's naive to shut them down. We don't know what we don't know, as far as I'm concerned. So that's my answer. Yeah. Do take it, if it makes any sense. No, it does. Uh, Charlotte. Um, I will defer to um, my half sister experience that I bring up regularly in the UFO topic. So it's like a metaphor. Um, grew up as an only child, much like the human race. And at 17, someone just happened to slip out a secret that I had a half sibling. So I did a lot of research. She lived two miles away her whole life. She'd been on holiday with my cousins, you know, that old story. So I kind of liken it to that. Of course, there's going to be, it's going to be there. You just don't know about it because there's been some secret in the family. So, um, but 
Oh. That's biological. What about other forms of life that we haven't even tried to think about or look for, like plasma-based, I don't know, or light entities or, you know, mental energy, something, I don't know. Can I, can I just add to that? I'm the same. I found out about six years ago that I have a half sister and brother. I'm the eldest. There you go. Weird, and uh, yeah, and they they only live two and a half miles up the road from me. Yeah. And they went to my school. What? So there you go. Wow. Yes. Yeah. My there you go. My friends, my cousins, really. Strange. Yeah, and and I found out that a circle of my friends knew them, and I didn't know. Yeah. It was like it was like it was like working in government. The left handers know what the right hand is yeah. doing. You know. There yeah, you go. Yeah. 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 Definitely. Really interesting. So I, I that is so that exciting to hear that. And I, I'd like to say it's also too, here. and I've said this, I've said this before, a giraffe doesn't know a shark exists. Just exactly. Leave it My Great cat's point, never man. seen a dolphin, but they exist, you know. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that is yeah. amazing. Come on, Zedestrom, what you got on this one? Oh wait, I have to answer my own one. <laughs> no, that was oh. his. That was his question. Yeah. Your question, yeah. Sorry about that, guys. I'm losing track of my mind, my mental state. Um, well, I want to hear from Deb. It's been a while from uh, since hearing from her. I'd like to go Deb, Courtney, uh, myself, and then DJ, so you can kind of close it out for it, if that's cool. Yeah. So Deb, yep. uh, why don't you tap yeah. it? I almost feel like it's the reverse has happened now. It's almost like the go-to answer when someone tries to have a conversation about NHI. A scientist says, "Well, of course, there's life." Of course, it's statistically. So the, the, it's all it's completely flipped. So <laughs> I don't think it's um, extraordinary to think about that at all. I think it's extremely egotistical and self-centered to think that we would be the only intelligent life. And I think if you ask people to imagine living with the other um, hominins that were on the planet with us in the past, they can't even imagine that. And that happened 100% for sure. And people can't accept that we are from various branches of those, um, I don't want to say beings. <laughs> They're basically like humans, right? We are, we're a mix of those. And we don't all exactly make up the same DNA for that reason. So I have a lot of Neanderthal. One of you may not have any Neanderthal. Am I still human? Yes by how we define it. So we just have to stop trying to think that we're so cookie cutter, life is so cookie cutter, it doesn't follow our rules. And I just wanted to chime in real quick about the plasma thing, that there was someone from the UK Energy Administration that had a very interesting video to explain the science of plasma, which I think is very important for understanding why they move and why they do what they do. And if you can find it, it's out there on YouTube. Cool, it's about complex plasmas, Deb. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Just wanted to throw that out there. It's such an interesting video. Intriguing. Yeah. Thank you. Ooh. Yes, Courtney. I'm really glad that Deb got to weigh in on the plasmas. <laughs> I'm really glad that she got that in there because we've talked about the plasmas, but she already mentioned it. So. I read a book one time, um, it was Robert Persig. It wasn't The Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, it was another less known book. And he was talking about these uh, seafaring guys, naval guys, and they were going along the coast of Nova Scotia and they were lost. And they started to see out on the horizon these lights. And they it tuned them into this mapping that they weren't, um, they weren't prepared for, they didn't see, they felt their navigation was off, but they saw it. So in this book, he goes and talks about it's very similar. It's like a metaphor for science. Our material science might see something like that, something fringe, and they see it, but there's like a collective immune system in the scientific world right now with materialism. And some scientists are seeing it. How are they quantifying life? But I like that story that Robert Persig wrote because there is an immune system almost over all this, fighting off new information, new data, just because it's kind of its own ecosystem where it's all the past science leading up into the present. But I do think with the questions of life, it does bear, especially with the extraordinary claims. You know, what is life? How do we quantify life? I like that Deb 
you know, weighed in on this as well, because she looks at that, like, what is intelligent life? And I love that question. And so I do feel like, when you have this debate with people, it's the first thing they say. It's thrown back into your face every time. Well, extraordinary claims require extraordinary <laughs> evidence. Well, but let's talk about the scientists who do have evidence. Why does there seem to be a blockade right now by some by some of our top level scientists pointing fingers at each other and calling each other, um, you know, names? And so I think it's interesting that that debate is happening. And I know that Gary Nolan has mentioned, been mentioned a couple of times by Rob already. I think he's one of the ones, one of the luminaries that's having that debate. And so I like to tune in to, and follow him and stand behind him because he seems to be talking about that, about what is intelligent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think about this one from the standpoint, uh, well, first of all, it's a very catchy saying, and that's why it's quite popular. It's just, uh, you know, it's, it really, it, it is. Uh, but I think about it from the standpoint of, of paradigms, right? And, it, it, you know, anything that's extraordinary is something that falls outside of the paradigm of the day, right? And the reality of the situation as I see it is we've always been shattering paradigms throughout history. Like every single paradigm basically gets shattered one after the other. And to some degree, that statement is true because there is really, in most cases, there's a, a point at which you have to accumulate enough evidence of a thing to convince consensus reality that the thing is actually real. And then all of a sudden, consensus reality shifts and goes, well, of course, I mean, of course we knew that you know <laughs> microbes were real. I mean, what do you mean? We've <laughs> always believed that microbes were real. You know, so it, it's, it's that kind of interesting thing. Uh, you know, evolution of ideas that that we tend to go through. Um, I what I get frustrated by is the use of that statement as a flippant, you know, kind of cudgel to shut down the conversation. So instead of saying, you know, well, that's an interesting claim, and I would like to learn more about that, and tell me tell me what you seem to know about that that I may not know. Let's explore this idea. Instead, it's just used as a, I don't want to talk about that. Um, we're going to move on because I'd rather stay within the confines of the comfort zone that I find myself in. It's just, it's, it's easier that way. And, you know, I find it interesting that the narratives that, you know, that we're kind of seeing right now, the two main narratives in the sort of UFO debate, you know, one is that this is all a bit of a bit of a game and Congress has been duped and you know, all this kind of stuff. It's an inside job, psyop, blah, blah, blah. And really, that's a that, that's a narrative of itself. It's a it's a it's an attempt to create some closure on a story that, for those people, they'd rather believe that story than the alternative, right? Yes. And the alternative is some obviously we represent. I think the alternative version of what the story might be, and and the reality is there's going to be a bit of a blend of these two ideas. That that's generally how things work. Is that there's you know both sides are going to be right to a certain degree, but I think we should all be willing to suspend judgment uh, almost in all things like we need to be kind of open-minded to a fault and maybe that's just yeah i i think i'm also of the opinion that people have personality tendencies right there are those who are very comfortable with ambiguity and you'll see a lot of those personalities in this community and you have people who really don't like ambiguity they must have closure certainty very binary thinking and look, I've got friends in both camps. I, I and, and they're great friends. I love these people, you know. So it's not that they're they're dumb or that they're out there that they're shills or they're grifters or whatever it is. It's just this is the kind of um, like the polarity that they're drawn toward, the thinking that they're drawn toward. So anyway, it's a, a long answer to your question, Dan. But I, I you know, I, I think it. We're not going to get rid of that phrase. I think it's going to be with us for a long time. But I do think <laughs> we are at a place now where we're starting to examine that a little bit more critically and be open to the fact that, uh, you know, it may not be as, as straightforward as we thought and that what we thought to be, to be true, we really believe to be true about reality is really breaking a little bit more, it seems, and we're now open to new possibilities. That's all I got. DJ. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, there's, there's so many ways to, uh, attack this question, you know, Deb pointed out about the scientific aspect. Um, Bob, uh, help me out, Bob McGuire, Dr. Bob McGuire, uh, Science Bob, he has a whole mathematical, he can take you, break it down to very simple math to where the probability is overwhelming. And some of you guys, um, I think Deb's alluded to that. Uh, there's also, we have hundreds and hundreds of witnesses that have described 
different craft and different um, coming from different places, uh, different uh, types of individuals inside that have a completely different look to talk about different missions that they have and different goals. Then recently I discovered Staff Sergeant Dan Sherman from the Air Force who wrote that book Way Above Black, uh, where um, he was able to, um, he was trained, he was part of a black program and underneath that layer was what he referred to as a, a gray program. And in that gray program, he learned how to communicate with ET in the 90s. And this is, you know, using very basic kind of Windows computer that um, he would get a message and he would type the message that he received into a box and hit send. And he tells you, frankly, I have no idea where that message went. But I did start to unravel in my communication with this ET that said that they were from another planet, uh, what those communications were. And in he figured out that in some cases they were coordinates on the map and that it was uh, it was alluding to uh, abductions, that they were aware that were taking place uh, with uh, with uh, the blessing uh, of the government uh, in some sort of an exchange, something that in my personal paradigm, I told Nathan, I don't believe that this didn't happen. I think this is BS. It doesn't exist. And it seems I was wrong. I believe I'm wrong because of what Dan Sherman says. And I also believe I'm wrong because David Grush, uh, while he didn't testify to this specific um, question in open session, he did tell Ross Coltart that. And so if he were asked that in open session, I believe that he would answer it the exact same way that he answered uh, the question to Ross Coltart, that there have been agreements. So there's so many different forms of evidence that we've talked about that could, even in a, in a criminal proceeding that are kind of beyond a reasonable doubt that there is something out there, where exactly it's from is not quite clear, but some of them have alluded to being from somewhere other than here. And specifically in Dan Sherman's and that program that he was in, uh, that's what they told him. And that we're from the same... We, they, his people, and us are from the same creator. This intelligent, what he called intelligent life. You'd have to read the book, and it's only 60 pages, so it won't take you very long. The fact is, though, the issue is that evidence to some people, and you, it's, it's objective and it's subjective. To me, there's some pretty darn good objective evidence in its to taken in its totality. But there are people that uh, Nathan talked about that are, are in our community that are not comfortable with not knowing, that are not comfortable with certainty, that even if you took them to a craft and let them touch it, they could say, this was fabricated sheet metal made by humans. So you will never meet that standard that they have. You only have to meet your standard and, and think critically and analytically and look at all the pieces put together by experiencers and by science and by what everybody here knows because uh, pretty much everybody here has been has spoken with uh, to someone with the government uh, th that has given them some knowledge and information about what the government thinks and knows. And we all know that they don't know <laughs> the totality of it, but they may know some, at least if you talk with, uh, listen to Dan Sherman and Dave Grush, and I think those are two great sources. But for some people you'll never meet that standard of objective evidence. They'll, they'll call it subjective. Uh, and that's fine. You know, good for them. Um, yeah. So <laughs> that's all I have, Dan. No, it's a great <laughs> response. And it was a great question, Dan. Like, I mean, we've had it so was. many guys, we've had so many amazing questions on we the have. show today. Um, we like some of these, I was thinking like we could do whole shows on some of the questions. They're just that good oh, yeah. and really great responses too. Um, you know, including yours, we, Nathan, by the way. Oh, well, thank you, DJ. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, before we do close the show, I just want to say thanks to all the folks that are watching along, those that are in the chat, those that are watching, whether on X or on Facebook or on YouTube. Um, if you are watching on X or Facebook, please do give our YouTube page uh, a, a like or subscribe. We'd love to, to see you around that space as well. It does help us kind of get the show out there. And uh, if you'd like us to you know, have a certain guest or a certain topic, please feel free to drop that in our socials. 
so we can take a look and hopefully make that episode happen. So anyway, that's all I got to say. The floor is yours again. May I may I jump in? With oh, please, yeah. Of, yes, sir. Just yeah. everyone's answer was beautiful. And I love that the people more than once touched on defining life and how we don't understand that. You know, in 10 years, are we going to realize that there's a sliding scale of awareness, just like there is for intelligence and, you know, a dog's aware and is as aware as we are? Um, it, it begs the question, but we need to come up with a definition. And I just wanted to put out there someone named Sarah Walker. She uh, is proposing something called assembly theory. And that looks at molecules and things that we find in terms of levels of complexity. Um, and it's a really interesting way of looking at it because it basically, when you look at this planet, you realize that we are related to everything else here and the process that took place that created everything else also created our brains and our bodies. And we're not separate from these things. We are of the world, you know? Um, and I thought that was really beautiful. And it, it helps to kind of think outside the box, you know, is that process itself feeling for these kind of gaps in, in an ecosystem and creating something that can fill that? Is that an intelligent process? Is that life? You know, we, we tend to think is, you know, the two arms, two legs, is that life? Our imagination is really limited. If something, for example, could see light and communicate it in light, we know a lot of deep sea fish communicate with light. If it came up to the surface and it saw the stars, would it start trying to communicate with them thinking it's God? Uh, really interesting things to consider. Um, but we have to remember our imagination is limited. And that brings me to the Shakespeare quote, you guys asked for one. And I think this sums it up perfectly. It's one from Hamlet. And it says, uh, <clears throat> there are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy. Dan, I'll send you a message after this. That's all I got to say, man. Damn. Damn, Damn. Damn that boy good. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, we got to, we got to close this down as Deb says, you know, uh, in terms of communication, light, sound frequency, she likes to point that out. Uh, that whole thing with, uh, those guys, uh, was it, um, remind me of the name of that group, uh, that, that has the, uh, that truck, uh, Jeremy and, um, Gary, UAPX. 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 Yes, yeah, that they were, the Osiris. Thank you, Courtney. They were transmitting that 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 whale sound uh, to to what they were trying to broadcast that to the phenomenon. We were just blown away when uh, it was uh, Dave Mason was telling us about that, or David Mason, I should say, so we don't confuse him with the musician. Um, Rob, thank you so much, sir. It was an honor and a pleasure to have you on. Um, Charlotte, as well. It's been forever since we've had you on. And Dan as well. I also, it, it was a pleasure. It's been way too long, so we need to get you guys back soon. I also want to say out there to everybody who tuned in and listened, I also want to thank all of you experiencers out there that have fed us the knowledge. I'll uh, include there are some of you that are, that are here on the panel today. Um, also, the government guys and gals that are, that are working hard at this. Uh, and, and of course, everybody in the community that's trying to get disclosure and, you know, we're all working towards some semblance of uh, disclosure for the topic. So on behalf of all of you, Money, Nathan, Debs, uh, Courtney, Rob, Charlotte, and my man, Dan, this is DJ saying peace out, one love. We'll see you down the road. And as always, we wonder what's up around the bend.